on today's Apple Daily, iOS 14.3 and watchOS Beta 7.2 point to imminent release of Fitness Plus and AirTags. Wireless CarPlay rolled out to more vehicles ahead of potential portless iPhone in 2021. And TSMC readies 4 nanometer process for 2022 iPhones with A16 chips and 5 nanometer plus for better power efficiency and performance for 2021. Plus a lot of iCave answers and notification squad. Let's get on with it. For the latest Apple news, rumors and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. Thanks Siri, and if you want all of our latest content, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can also be entered for our giveaway later in the video. iOS 14.3 and watchOS Beta 7.2 point to imminent release of Fitness Plus and AirTags. So yes, in the latest releases of uh, iOS 14.3 and watchOS, the betas, these are the developer betas, there are references in there to Fitness Plus, there is uh, more accurate Fitness Plus tracking settings that can be switched on and off, splash screen on the watch, which is all very, very exciting. Apple did mention that Fitness Plus would be coming by the end of the year, so who knows, are we going to get that extra Apple event to announce this, or is it just going to be a full-on website refresh? Is it going to be an Apple newsroom release? We just don't know. But I have a feeling if they're going to release any new products, like for example the AirTags, which John Prosser has said for a while we are expecting to come with, with iOS 14.3, then it would make a lot of sense for them to come in another maybe a 45 minute presentation that they put out on the website again. Who knows? We could have a fourth Apple event for the end of this year. That would be kind of fun. And if they did that, would they just mention something they've already launched? Uh, a new service with AirTags? Who knows? Maybe those AirTags are related more to Fitness Plus than we thought in the first place. Wireless CarPlay rolled out to more vehicles ahead of potential portless iPhone in 2021. Weirdly enough, we've got a few future iPhone rumours in today's show. So we've got... Portless iPhones coming in 2021, that is the rumour, this has come via Ming-Chi Kuo, but the extra cars coming with wireless uh, CarPlay is a real thing that's happening right now. So we have actually got a bit of evidence for it, which is quite nice. Now, there are obviously a huge number of cars out there that only support wired CarPlay right now, and if you remember, before the iPhone was released and before we knew really what MagSafe was all about, I did mention that I have a feeling that it could be for CarPlay compatibility once a portless iPhone happens. The easiest way to implement this would be the fact that the MagSafe adapter in the back of your phone has got an NFC ring built into it, which is generally there to read what the accessory is that it's connecting to, but it could potentially be used in future in a CarPlay mount for a car and have a unique identifier in there which creates a Bluetooth connection. Essentially, your wired CarPlay for the car will be connected to your car mount rather than the iPhone itself, and then the car mount will connect to your iPhone to transfer all the data via Bluetooth or a uh, ad hoc Wi-Fi connection. Either of those would work, I think. It would be certainly interesting to see what happens. I think the ad hoc Wi-Fi would actually be faster and could potentially work as like a hotspot for your car as well. Now, portless iPhones is definitely something that's uh, been suggested. Ming-Chi Kuo is saying at least one portless iPhone next year, which if they're going to release four iPhones again like they did this year, which is what the rumors are saying already, same sizes, which one would they make portless? Would it just be the Mini or would they make both Pros portless or would it be that the higher end Pros keep the port for bigger file transfers? It's very difficult to know, but these are the rumors that we're getting. Maybe it'll just be all of them. Let me know in the comments if you think we are ready for portless iPhones. And moving on to 2022, we're talking iPhone 14 here. TSMC readies the 4 nanometer process for 2022 iPhones with A16 chips. Right now it looks like every two years TSMC are being able to shrink their dies down to make even smaller and faster and more efficient chips where you can pack even more transistors into a small space. Now it doesn't look like we'll be getting a die shrink for next year, as I say every two years is more likely to be the case, but 5 nanometer plus technology will still improve efficiency and performance in the same space with the bigger jump coming in 2022 
for the A16 chip. Of course, these efficiency gains will also translate now over to the Max, which makes Apple Silicon an even more impressive thing than it already is. I can't wait to see what they do with the next set. And let's get on to iCave answers. We have got a lot of questions to get through today, so let's get right into it. First up comes from Aran Candlewell. What should I upgrade? Storage or RAM I'll be using for at least five years. So he's talking about Apple Silicon here. And in terms of long-term use, I would certainly be looking to upgrade the RAM over the storage. But because the RAM is part of the system on a chip and the storage Although it's not upgradable within the device, you certainly can't externally upgrade your RAM. So as well as being able to connect external storage to the device, cloud storage is getting more and more usable every single day. When we looked five years ago, you really needed to have the storage that you needed on your device. Now it's far more practical in most situations to stream video, stream music, and anything that is your own can be using uh, iCloud storage, or there are plenty of free storage solutions. Even YouTube can be used as basically a free backup service for your videos. You will lose a little bit of quality, but you can upload them all as just private videos and keep them on YouTube. Next up, Lidor Shataf, M1 chip. Will it be possible to download apps like Netflix, Instagram, and Facebook in the future? I want to see Netflix offline and only in the app as possible. So yeah, one of the slightly disappointing things about uh, Apple Silicon is not actually from Apple's side, but from the developer's side. There are a lot of developers that are taking what would have been an iOS app or an iPad app that would have easily been able to run natively on the Apple Silicon and not permitting it to. Now, we certainly know that YouTube and Facebook weren't allowing their apps across, and that seems to be because of advertising revenues, because Apple was bringing more clarity to what was being tracked inside and outside of apps. They want to use the browser so that they can track you between websites, and it makes it a lot easier for them to get their revenues. For something like Netflix, I'm not 100% sure why they're doing it, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. They say they've got no plans to bring it immediately to Apple Silicon, but that might change as and when user base increases on it. Next up, Suvik Murkaji, Notification Squad. Thank you for joining that as well. People keep asking when touchscreen Macs will appear. I honestly think that the M1 Macs literally destroy all the windows. What's your take? I'm one of the earliest subscribers, doing a phenomenal job. You deserve way more subscribers. Well, thank you very much for that. Touchscreen Macs. I don't think they're going to bring touchscreens to the whole range. Uh, I do think that there will be limited touch compatible Macs, but I think it's going to be more around the Apple Pencil than I think it's going to be around poking your Macs with your fingers because let's be honest, most of these are very thin screens. Um, it's going to have to add some durability to the displays themselves in order to make um, touch a viable option on them. Uh, and also the angle of like a laptop screen is not conducive to using touch all the time. It's going to make your arm hurt because these are not going to be convertibles. We've got iPads for that. When you're out and about and you want to use a touchscreen device, the iPad or the iPhone is a much better option. I do think, and I mentioned this way, way back when I was talking about my kind of wish list for Apple Silicon iMacs, that I think an iMac with a Surface Studio style display that folds all the way down to almost flat that you can use with Apple Pencil to draw on it like a drawing board would be super compelling, especially if this Apple Pencil 3 that I had in mind, I'm not sure where I got the idea from, if it was actually from a rumor or if it was something that I came up with, probably from a rumor, it seems too clever for me, but the idea of being able to tap your Apple Pencil on something in the real world and grab that color, so tapping it on my hand and grabbing that flesh tone to then be able to paint with by having a, a camera in the Apple Pencil, I think that would be super magical and exactly the sort of thing that Apple would do. Val Kitchen, the Val Nerd, uh, asks, I am trying to use uh, Microsoft apps on my iPad, such as Word and OneNote. Wouldn't let me edit any documents, tell me, tells me I need 365. Is this a glitch or do I actually have to pay for a subscription to use the apps? I'm trying to do it for a tech video. Yeah, unfortunately, if you want to use the Microsoft uh, Office apps, on your iPad, you do need to pay for a subscription if you want to be able to edit stuff. You've got a free viewer there, and I have a feeling the iPhone versions you can actually do some edits on. I have a weird feeling that Microsoft had this uh, rule about different screen sizes, and if it's under a certain screen size, then you can edit for free, and if it's over a certain screen size, you can't. So there may be a workaround where you can actually install the iOS app onto your iPad rather than using the iPad optimized version and you might be able to do some stuff like that uh, but it will be the kind of more limited iPhone style version. Uh, worth having a look, 
I will see if I can check it out. Yeah, if you can, I will tell you now. Nope, turns out you can't. You're going to have to pay. Sorry. Val, I'm pretty sure that you're a full-time student, so you may well find that there is a very... Uh, discounted version that you can pick up or you may even find that your school has a volume license that you're able to tap into definitely worth asking the question the official team b asks i cave answers why uh, why do you like apple products and why did you switch from android or windows uh, i was definitely a windows user i was not an android user at any point you know voluntarily i had to have one for work at one point and it made me want to hurt myself but my first Apple device was an iPhone 4 that I bought at the end of 2010 when it had just come out. It was one of these phones that literally you could not find anywhere. There were none available and I just happened to walk into an O2 store here in the UK and they had one and I was like, okay, I'll have that because I was due an upgrade anyway and I really wasn't that convinced by Apple stuff at the time, um, but everyone was talking about it. So I thought I will go for it. Um, and literally I had people asking me to look at this phone because it was so revolutionary for people. But previous to that I'd used some smartphones, smartphones I say in inverted commas, so I think it was an XDA Orbit was my first, uh, or one of my first smartphones, then I had an XDA Touch Diamond. Um, I will try and find pictures of these things to put up on the screen. They were pretty iPhone-ish compared to the majority of smartphones at the time. Um, then I went to Dubai for a the best part of a year, came back, bought my first Mac, which was an 11-inch uh, MacBook Air. Uh, that was a 2011 model. Then got really into it all. About 2013 was when I bought this iMac. That was bought brand new. Um, I did, in the meantime, though, actually buy some older Macs that I picked up that were, like, used. Went to a car boot sale, got a Power Mac G3 for £10, uh, which also works still, um, and is surprisingly smooth for a 350 megahertz processor. You still got all the dock animations and stuff, it all works beautifully. But I've got a loft full of old Mac stuff because I started collecting it. Hadn't actually bought much new stuff for a couple of years before I started the channel, but since it has started, we've had the Apple Watch SE Nike Edition, uh, new iPad Air, I've had my new iPhone 12 Pro Max, which is what you're watching this on right now. Uh, I mean, you're not watching it on it, but it's what's filming it, what's videoing it. I got in trouble for saying filming the other day. In our house, we use Apple TV. We've got the new HomePod. We've got, you know, everything in our house, pretty much. Both of the kids have got um, old iPad minis uh, and iPads that we've kind of had as hand-me-downs. So they both have those. My wife has now got the MacBook Air with M1 chip. So we're kind of a Mackie household. I just despise using Windows, to be completely honest. Uncle Bruh asks, I cave answers. Uh, so with the release of HomePod minis, do you think Apple would ever allow 5.1 or even 7.2 surround sound feature using multiple HomePod minis and one to two HomePods with the Apple TV? I think it would be a groundbreaking feature for someone so deep in the ecosystem. Um, great question. So Apple is already including some of the support for this stuff. Um, for all the home cinema stuff, though, it is the main home pods and not the mini home pods that they're using. You can basically put a couple in front of your TV, one on each side, and you will get full Dol Dolby Atmos support um, built into that. And you can set it as the default speaker for an Apple TV. You need the Apple TV 4K to be able to run it because it needs to have the higher end processor. The HomePod Minis do not support this, though. Uh, you can use them as a stereo pair, I believe, but you can't use them for Dolby Atmos. Um, it would be a fun thing to have down the line, to have the option of kind of going, well, I've got this and this and this, and we can put them all around it. But in terms of price-wise, if you're going to be using regular HomePods and HomePod Minis, you're going to be looking at over a £1,000 worth of stuff to get started with a 5.1, so... Mm, probably a little bit over the top uh, for what most people need and also they'd all need to be plugged into the mains so a um, little bit tricky but it would be cool don't think they will and last up Sander Hoogeland uh, iCave answers could you talk a bit more about your stance on Epic and the rest versus Apple issue yeah absolutely so we mentioned this in yesterday's show that the uh, Apple commission has been cut from 30 to 15 percent for the vast majority of uh, developers. Anyone that's making less than a million dollars a year from the App Store is now on the lower commission rate, which is also the commission rate that exists for the second year of subscriptions and things like that. And I think there's a, a couple of apps that maybe got 15%, maybe Netflix for internal signups, something like that. Don't quote me on that one. But my stance on it is that, yes, absolutely Epic should be paying their cut 
to the App Store. The whole thing was manufactured to get more eyes on Epic. I think they're regretting it now because they've realised just how much revenue they're probably losing by not having it in the App Store because it was a huge amount of money that they were making from iOS customers. At this point, it feels like they have probably taken it too far and are regretting their decisions because all of the confusion with was their Unreal Engine going to be taken out or were they going to have full developer access for anything else? Um, and the fact that Apple didn't just pull Fortnite, they pulled all of their games from the App Store. Um, I think Apple did the right thing because there was a contract in place. It said, if you want to be in the App Store, here's how it works. We have 30% uh, cut from any uh, from any purchases that are made and you can't use a different payment system to get around this. Now there are options like you could uh, potentially sell gift cards that you can redeem in the game that would have been allowed I believe. Um, what you can't do though is direct people out of the app to buy stuff at a lower price from outside the app. Like that's just not allowed because what's the point then if Apple's providing the service, they're providing checking services to make sure that the apps are secure. They're also providing access to their customer base, people that use Apple's service through Apple's store. And yes, the only way to get onto an iPhone is through Apple's store, unless you want to do a web app of some sort, but them's the rules of the game and Google Play does the same and Xbox does the same and PlayStation does the same and Nintendo Switch does the same. Like 30% is kind of the universal standard pretty much uh, and that all comes from when Apple started the App Store that was the the standard that has been set and now Apple is pretty much undercutting everyone else especially for these indie games so I think that's a really good uh, move from Apple it is going to upset Spotify it is going to upset Epic Games but uh, as I said yesterday if you were doing it as a tax system which it is not if you were doing a tax system the people at the bottom get a tax break in order to help them grow and then once you are successful you pay a bit more tax because you can afford to which helps to subsidize everyone else that's how it should be and i i personally agree with apple's side on this as you can probably imagine because i am very much an apple sheep esr unboxing time right we've got another case from esr today this one is i believe the one with the flippy out metal stand looks like it so this is a flexible plastic case we have got at the back this aluminium kickstand so you can stand your phone up on a surface like this I don't know if it will go this way yeah that's pretty sturdy you can actually stand it up like that uh, you can also stand it up upright portrait you can go portrait or you can go horizontal um, landscape I think that's called but this is quite cool I like the idea because what I do hate is pop uh, pop stands is, it, is that what they're called when you have that little circle on the back that pulls out because they're just bulky whereas this thing is actually quite quite discreet in comparison and that actually clips down a little bit further so that actually goes to just like that um so i like this one we're going to throw it on the phone i'm going to shoot some b-roll i'm going to throw it in over the top of this i didn't yesterday because i suck but remember we are giving away pretty much all of this uh, esr stuff at the end of the week or the beginning of next week probably so if you want to be in with a chance of winning make sure you're in the notification squad use that hashtag notification squad in the comments to let me know that you have subscribed and rung the bell so that i know you did it and then uh, you'll be in the draw so last up for today we have notification squad and i have to read these off the thing i'm not learning my lines for this abhishek sharan jojo berita uncle bro and Master and Gravity. Thank you for joining the notification squad. That means that you guys will know every time we publish a new video and you can watch it uh, super early. And pretty much all the time now when we uh, set a new video live at 12 UTC every day, um, I am there in the live chat chatting with you guys. I really enjoy having that interaction with you. And I would like to do some more live streams. So if you want some more live streams, let me know down in the comments. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.